You all know we're going to talk to our good friend Pete Hegseth, and, but I want to say a few things about Pete before we get started. I have in front of me a very long bio, which is on his uh, Speakers Bureau page, and it says a lot of really wonderful things about him. All true. Uh, I'll hit a couple of highlights, but I'm not going to read it to you because I want to tell you about the guy that I know who is not necessarily reflected in his bio. You know, most of you know Pete from Fox and Friends, so he's become, he's definitely one of the rising stars on Fox. Uh, we see him on all kinds of remotes. He fills in for everybody. Uh, he's a true patriot. He's a real believer. Uh, he's obviously a host of Fox and F Friends Weekend. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw on his Instagram page, but just a few days ago, he got married. Did you guys see that? It's pretty cool. In addition to his Fox and Friends duties, he is a father of a blended family of seven, so he's a busy guy. Uh, so, you know, he's a decorated war hero, uh, three tours since 9-11, counterinsurgency was his specialty. So we're talking to a, a real, honest to God, patriot and, and hero here. Uh, but there's something I want to tell you about Pete that's actually to me, more important about who he is. And, and that is how we came to know each other. And this is really unusual. We, first of all, we try not to chase endorsers. We're not really interested in that. If people want to endorse us, we really appreciate being endorsed uh, because it helps us to raise our profile. But we don't go around and chase endorsers, politicians, public figures, or anything like that. You guys suggest people. Sometimes you introduce us to people. Pete came to us in, in the most unusual way that any endorser has ever come to Convention of States. Uh, we have uh, somebody who is a great patriot. Is Cindy Nation here, by the way? Where is Cindy? Yeah, there's Cindy Nation right there. She's the one who answers all of our emails. And we get thousands of them and phone calls. And this is incredible. She's a volunteer. This is what she does. And so she handles all of these. She makes sure everybody gets treated with respect and, and that everything gets forwarded to the right place. It's a huge job. And one day she forwarded an email to me. And you guys probably ought to meet. And she said... Uh, yeah, I got this email from Pete Hegseth, and it says Pete Hegseth at Fox and Friends. I actually think it's Pete Hegseth. <laughs> he re so, look, Pete could have reached out to any number of people and gotten a hold of me directly, right? I mean, he, we know all kinds of people in common. Uh, I know Neil Cavuto really well. I mean, he could have just asked around at Fox and Friends and gotten a direct phone number for me, and, and he could have called, which is, by the way, what most people who have any kind of public fame would do. Right? They would figure out a channel how they could make direct contact. But Pete wrote to the info at account. And so I reached out to Pete. Yeah, it's really cool. And I reached out to Pete and he said, I really want to meet you. Can you come to Fox? And so it was actually Patty was with me and we went to Fox and we sat in the cafeteria. Pete took a couple hours with us. I mean, I was blown away how long he took. And I said, why did you contact me through the info ad account? That's so strange. And he said, because I wanted to see what you would do. <laughs> really, look, look, Pete ran a nonprofit. This is really important. So Pete ran a nonprofit, concerned veterans, you know, taking care of our veterans, trying to reform the VA. And he knows what it's like to run a nonprofit. And he said, most nonprofits, if you send something to the info ad account, it's basically a trash can, right? It just, nobody ever reads them. It's just a way to defer people who really want to ask you a question. And you get a lot of questions that aren't rational or reasonable. Going through them is not easy. It takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. But it reflects, Pete said it reflects on who you are. And so he was impressed that Cindy got that email and actually read it and actually forwarded it and that he got a call from me. And so first, a huge round of applause for Cindy, for her story. Can you stand up for a second, Cindy, please? Really incredible. Thank you. That's what makes this organization great. So we sat down with Pete, and Pete, I think, talked first at this meeting. And I think Patty and I will never forget it, because he gave the best pitch for Convention of States I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> he finished, I'm like, yes. <laughs> I don't know what else to say other than yes. And I know we're going to talk about this, but one of the things that Pete said that I think is so poignant, I've told the story hundreds of times around the country, is Pete said, look, you sit at the perfect intersection of grassroots activism. This is a cause where people can be and must be engaged at the local level, which is where grassroots activism takes place, but you're engaged in a national cause. And that is the sweet spot 
for grassroots activism. So that's how Pete got involved. He said, I will do anything I can to help you. I don't want to charge you. I don't want anything for it. I don't have a lot of time to give to causes because of my career and my family and all this stuff, but you guys are my cause. How incredible is that? Okay. So, what we're going to do today is I, you get to see Pete on TV. I want you to see Pete sort of behind the scenes, hear what he thinks about activism, hear a little bit of his story. It is just an incredible honor and a privilege for all of us to sit down with my guest and my friend, Pete Hegseth. Awesome. So I'll talk for 10 minutes and then we'll yep. go. Awesome. Well, Mark, you stole my entire speech, <laughs> as happens. Listen, you guys could not have a better leader in this righteous cause than Mark Meckler. Uh, and I will definitely count myself as defiant. I like that as an explanation of who you are and what this is. Uh, looking around at the world we live in, the country that we have, that we love and that we cherish, and saying, I will not stand idly by as people with the, with the, with, who reject our Constitution, who reject our Declaration, who reject our founding, tear it apart day after day. And so thank you for what you do. I had someone come up to me outside and say, are you going to get up there and inspire us? And I said, you know, what you know what's inspiring is looking out at this right here. You inspire me. Uh, you, in you inspire me by taking your time, your money, your energy, your credibility, your reputation, and putting it on the line where you live with your state legislators, as he said it. I it's easy to send emails to Washington to someone you haven't met. It's more difficult, it's easier and more difficult to sit down with someone who you know is your neighbor or on your city council or your state representative and look them in the eye and challenge them to do the right thing in challenging moments. And ultimately, you end up usually dragging them across the finish line after educating them to do the thing they really should have done in the first place. But you, you can't do that Un unless and until you build an army that holds them accountable. What was said earlier is so true. If you build it, they will come. If you don't build it, they will ignore you. Because most politicians, Republicans and Democrats, their heads are on a swivel. They're looking around for the next best thing. They're looking around for who can benefit them, who's going to get them elected again. And they forget that first inspirational moment about why they ran for office in the first place is because they love this country that was gifted to us. It's your job to remind them, bring them back to that founding spirit, and then scare the heck out of them. <laughs> Seriously, if they, don't, if they don't do the right thing, you're right there behind them. Uh, I used to say at the end of a lot of my speeches, uh, having served in the military, I fought, and this is years, years ago, said, I fought and put on the uniform so that my kids wouldn't have to. Right? I, I said that a lot. And I think it's a comfy platitude, and it started mostly after World War II. If you think about the vets came back and defeated the Nazis, they came home and said, hey, guys, we saved the world. Now let's rebuild here at home, and I want you to live in peace, even though we know perpetual peace is Immanuel Kant was lying to us. But there is no, no such thing. But that was the idea. And then after 9-11, a lot of us, you know, you, what, what, what came to our shores, what I've come to realize as a student of history, as a student of our country, as a student of human nature, uh, is that that's just not true. I now look at my kids in the eye and I say, I fought and you're going to have to as well. Every single generation. And it's not going to be the elites in Manhattan that are going to do this. You know, they, you know they fight us. Listen, I work... Some of them in Manhattan are going to be doing it. A few. <laughs> Some of them in Manhattan will be fighting. I find the one guy in the Yankees hat. <laughs> That's right. That's my point. 
My point is, but there is one, well, maybe there's two square block, blocks, but there is one square block of sanity in Manhattan, in Midtown, it's called Fox News Channel, okay? And then wherever he lives. <laughs> uh, it's there, we, but, but the vast majority of everyone else in elite culture, whether it's universities, in media, in social media, in Silicon Valley, they loathe you. They think they know better than you. They believe they're smarter than you and, and everything you believe in is so yesterday. Not just yesterday, but wrong and backwards. And what I love about this room and the values of this room is that you look over here and these are not props. The word of God and Jesus Christ our Savior is the guide for all of our lives. Our founders understood that. Our founders understood how integral that is to the American experiment, to Western civilization. This flag is not a prop. It's what we wore on our shoulders. It's what we fly every day. It's what we stand for because we understand what it stands for. And what you guys understand, and it's our job to educate folks for, and I know this has been talked about, is this is the real Constitution, not this one. All right? And it, if we're guided by that, uh, we can't go wrong, and ultimate, but ultimately the stakes of our moment compel us to do it because our culture, as I said, our media, our politics have gone almost exclusively in the other direction, uh, and, and we are at a revolutionary moment, and you get, a, you get a chance to be a part of the second American revolution without the bullets, okay? That's where we are. That is truly where we are. Because history is not over. What you understand is that history is not over. You don't hit pause. Uh, and that's where a lot of people miss the idea. They see the prosperity. They see the opportunity. They see, they see everything we have in this country. And they, they think inevitably that will perpetuate itself. No, history. The Romans thought the same thing. The Brits thought the same thing. Every human hubris is part of the human condition. You're, you're, my, you're myopically focused on your moment without understanding that history continues to steamroll with human nature, our flawed, sinful nature not changing. And if we don't recognize that, we get comfy and cozy where we are, and then pretty soon, 20 years later, we've lost it. History's not over, and America's not inevitable. There's nothing about the American experiment that says 25 years from now, uh, we will be free, less free, more free. We make choices in our daily lives about whether to fight to keep it free or not. That's what this is about. And the final aspect from history not being over uh, and, and America not being inevitable is that if the 21st century, this century, is not an American-led century, meaning vibrant America, true to its values, then the 21st century will not be a free century. This century will turn dark because there's nowhere else to sail to. There ain't no, we, we just found out we're not getting Greenland. There's nowhere else. Maybe we'll still get it. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I do. It's here or nowhere else. Because look at the ideologies and ascendant views around the world. The communist Chinese who have as much or more global ambitions than anyone in the world. Uh, Russia that wants to be the Soviet Union again and already is in, in, in all intents and purposes. Radical Islamism. Uh, the internationalists that control Europe in the view of this one world government run by bureaucrats. There is no other freedom loving bastion in the world that values the individual with, with, with God endowed rights. There, it's not there. So if we don't save this one, there's nowhere else to go. And literally, the trajectory of history of the future is dark. That is why you should look at this moment and say, it is either me now on this ground or it's nobody else. And it's always been the 1% or the 2% or the 3% of people that get it, that are willing to buck the comfiness of their moment and the establishment norms that everyone's comfortable with, willing to be defiant, willing to stand for real, what be accused of being radical about things that are not radical at all, probably the biggest challenge you face, right? It's like, man, you're crazy. What are you talking about? That's where I was in 2014 and 2015 until I emailed the info account. 
But you know, you know what it was? I kept showing up at event, at event, at event, at event. I'm not kidding you. And I kept seeing that Convention of States lapel. And the button or any one of it. And they kept coming up to me every time. Have you heard of Convention of States? I'm like, nah. What are you talking? Have you heard of it? Have you heard of it? Have you looked at it? Have you looked at it? And then I started, and then as, you, as you grow and learn in politics, as, as was so articulately talked about, you start to see what fails over and over and over again. And it's the stale establishment approach of incremental change in one direction or another of Republicans and Democrats. And you start to look around and say, there's got to be something that empowers us bigger than that. And when you look around and you find Article 5, it's like the lights go on. And it's our job to turn them on for everybody else. So our founders gave us this gift. May we live worthy of it. And to put it in our current context, why now as well? Because a lot of us breathed a big sigh of relief on election day of 2016. And then we've spent the last two or three years watching what they've done to President Trump. And if, any, if they can do it to him, the way that they've done it, they will do it to every single one of us in a blink of an eye. Now is our moment to build that army, whether you're being successful in your legislature or not, because the day and the moment will come where you can get it passed. The right people do get elected, committee assignments change, and then you're there to add your state to the number of states that build this movement. I see that my 10 minutes are up, but we'll take some Q&A. I love you guys, thank you very much. <laughs> we got a while to go here. We're going to spend some time together. Uh, so, Pete, just I want to back up a little bit. You have an interesting career, an interesting career path. Can you give us kind of a summary of, like, how'd you grow up? How'd you end up in the military? How'd you get from the military into politics and nonprofit? Oh, boy. Uh, every iteration is life of life is God opens, closes doors and opens doors and opens them and closes them again. And uh, if you're willing to tap into his purpose in your life and then have the courage to try to do it, you're never prepared for the next chapter ever of any job you have in life. I heard that from a lot of people saying, I took this job and I'd never done it before. You're never prepared for the next job you take because you've never done it before. Uh, you just have to have the courage to, to, to step out. Listen, I, I call myself a child of privilege because I had parents that loved me and we went to a church that taught the gospel and a community that was patriotic and faith-filled and I got to play sports and work hard. And Where that was that? Where'd you grow? Forest Lake, Minnesota. Where's my <clears throat> Minnesota folks here? There we go. Uh, loved it. And then I went to, I was dumb enough to think that a small town kid with good grades could go to an Ivy League school. So I went to Princeton where I played basketball. That's all I cared about until I was 20 years old was basketball. Uh, and I sat on the bench for four years, but whatever. <laughs> uh, but I did, I almost went to West Point. Instead, I did ROTC at Princeton. I was not from a military family. I just knew I, I, I wanted to serve because of the civic ritual of small towns in Minnesota that, that revered veterans and Memorial Day and Veterans Day were elevated. I wasn't from a military family. That's why I'm such a big believer in civic ritual uh, and parades and ceremonies because kids absorb that and see that and they see what our culture and country reveres. And what we choose to revere has an influence on kids, which is why I'm so passionate about Schools and public schools, I think education is a number one if we want to take our culture back. That's where we've lost it. I mean, it's faith, but you rip God out of schools and then you wonder why we go where we are, where we are in this country. Uh, so I had all of those advantages. Uh, then I went to the military. It's a long, I'll make a long story short, but I was mostly in the National Guard, but I deployed to Iraq for a year as a platoon leader. I deployed to Guantanamo Bay as a, as a guard, a platoon leader guard for a year. Uh, and then when I came back, I was so frustrated with what was happening in the war, I started or be, became a, bar, a part of the early parts of a vets group called Vets for Freedom that was fighting to help out the warfighter on the battlefield who was being thrown under the bus by politicians. Uh, and ultimately, that led to the surge, which was very successful and undone by Barack Obama, but we won't go there. Uh, but I learned about politics by doing, and you learn... Uh, I go from one day being in uniform to the next day being in the Oval Office talking to the president, George W. Bush, about you know, military strategy, and that had nothing to do with more than just saying, I will raise my hand and try to do something about it. And, and I didn't know anything other than that. And 
I w see what happened after that. I don't know. I ran for the Senate in Minnesota and got crushed. Uh, best thing that ever happened to me. Minnesota's mistake, though. I Minnesota, have to say. yeah. Um, and then I, was, I went to Harvard for a master's, and I went to Afghanistan for a year, and then I ran Concerned Vets for America, which fought for VA reform. Everything you need to know about the federal. Well, everything you need to know about federal dysfunction, I learned at the Department of Veterans Affairs. <laughs> I mean, it's true. Every, every part of the swamp, every part of special interests, every part of governmental and bureaucratic dysfunction, every part of socialized medicine, what it does, what it wants to do to vets, how it treats individuals, what collectivism looks like, can be seen through the lens of the VA. And, and, and like this, the answer is simple. It's empowering a veteran to make a choice. Let them choose whether they want to go to a VA facility or a private doctor and the dollars follow then, and then the whole system changes when the bureaucracy has to treat them like a customer and not like a number. Uh, it's, it's easy. So, so like the previous gentleman, I've learned more by failing than by succeeding. <laughs> That's the best way to learn uh, in advocacy, and thankfully you've got people who've done a lot of good failing, so now we can win this one, because I think we will and can. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you ended up on Fox News in the first place and kind of what it's been like being there and what you've learned from Yeah, totally of. accidental. I mean, I, I, as a veteran's advocate, then sometimes they'll ask you to come on TV uh, to discuss issues of the day related to the military and vets. So the first TV hit I ever did was in 2006 or seven on Hardball with Chris Matthews. Oof. And I'd, I'd never done TV before in my life, and my Marine buddy, who'd done like two TV hits, so he was an expert. Uh, <laughs> Marines are always Marines experts. Marines are always they experts. They think so, anyway. They sure do. Uh, he goes, hey, uh, lean forward in your seat, because that makes you look, you know, sort of lean forward and don't let them cut you off. So I leaned forward, and being cut off 35 times later, that segment <laughs> went great. Uh, but it's, again, it's learned by doing, and it must have been good enough, because I was a guest regularly on Hardball, and I was a guest until the Iraq war started to turn, and then they didn't invite me anymore. Once again, your, your first invitation into understanding what fake news really is, that it's not just what they say, it's what they don't say, and what they don't cover. So after that, I, got, I did more stuff, I deployed again, so it was sort of up and down. My goal was never to be on TV. I see TV as a vehicle through which to be an advocate for my country. There's a lot of people on TV, they just want to put the makeup on and be on TV. Count me out for that. I don't want any part of that. If that's what it ever came, became for me, then I would be done with it. To me, it's an opportunity to, to continue to fight for the things that we love in this country. And, <laughs> so if Fox is going to you know, pay me decently to wear makeup and do that, then that's fine. <laughs> uh, and so one day, Fox and Friends said, have you ever tried hosting instead of being a guest? And I hadn't, and they threw me on the couch. And, uh, it must have been okay. And at that point, Tucker Carlson was the Fox and Friends weekend host, if you remember. And then when Tucker got a big old promotion, uh, then I became the full-time uh, Fox and Friends weekend host in, formerly in his spot because there's usually a big old conservative on that side of the couch. So uh, the wonderful thing is no one tells us, no one tells me what to say. Uh, we get to watch the news and respond to it, and uh, we got a lot of news these days. So. Somebody else watches you and responds to you guys, it <laughs> seems like a lot, right? <laughs> we do have a pretty, uh, one particular viewer who, who likes to tweet every once in a while during the show. Uh, listen, I think it's amazing, because if you want to cut through the information cycle of people that tell you what Washington wants you to hear, how do you get it? Uh, you either pick up the phone, which we know he does, or you turn on the, the TV and you watch people who, are, who don't have an agenda other than what they believe is good and right and true for the country. I mean, thank goodness our president watches Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson and Judge Jeanine and Mark Levin and people like that. Because if I was making decisions, I would look at them and say, hey, what do these guys think? I'm going to include that as a data point. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. So the left hates that and derides him for that. And I think part of the reason he's been so faithful uh, to the agenda he laid out, which he's had the courage to follow through on, is that there have been honest voices out there by his side. I agree. So remember, 
Like, I have the privilege of sitting up here with Pete and asking him questions. You guys get to ask questions, too. So we've got people with cards out there. If you guys want to fill out cards and submit questions, go ahead and raise your hand. Somebody will come around, give you a card and a pen. You guys can ask questions. So we'll do that in a few minutes. For now, it's, I, I have the privilege. There we go. Uh, I know you have had a personal relationship with the president. I, you've been seen at the White House with the president. I know you've talked to him. Tell us a little bit about your personal impressions of the president away from the limelight. What's, what's he like and what's your relationship like? Yeah, uh, listen, the most reassuring thing to me from the beginning in having interactions with him is that he's the same person in private that he is in public. Listen, you, he, is, he is who he is. You know what you're getting. Uh, and and, I, and if, you're, if you're on the left, that drives you nuts. And if you're a patriot and love this country, it's very reassuring. Uh, and it's what I've, and listen, I'll give you a, a quick anecdote of my first interaction with him ever. I'd never met the guy in my life, okay? And I had, um, like a lot of people, I was a Rubio supporter first, and then I was a Cruz supporter, and then I had my Trump conversion moments, and then it finally light bulbs went off. Like, for a lot of us, this has been a process of understanding the stakes of, frankly, what the left has become in our country, and, and how... How, how much they've infected the culture and how this is, a, this is not just a right-left dynamic of marginal tax rates. This is about whether America is good and whether it should be free, and that's what we're fighting. So anyway, you get to Trump, and I was a critical of him at first, but then I did a lot of uh, vets work, and after he was elected, I was under consideration for the VA secretary job because we'd done a ton of work on that. And so I, I got a call, will you come to Trump Tower and meet the president-elect? And again, I'd never met him before. And so I go to Trump Tower, go up the elevator, come around the corner, and there he is sitting behind the desk. And I walk in, and the first thing he says to me, he goes, Pete, at the beginning, you were very bad to me. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say to that? I was like, you're right, Mr. President. He goes, wait, wait. At the beginning, who were you for? <laughs> And I was like, well, oh, Mr. Mr. President-elect, I was for Rubio because he was good on vet stuff. He goes, oh, oh, little Marco. You went with little Marco? <laughs> <laughs> and then he turns to, to uh, Sean Spicer, or no, it was uh, Brian Priebus who was there. He goes, weren't those great? Little Marco, Lion Ted, Crooked Hillary, the best. <laughs> and, I'll not, and I'm like, I'm in, a, I'm in a, you know, bizarro world, right? <laughs> And then I walk in a little bit more, and, and I, I, I didn't interrupt him, but I interjected. I said, but Mr. President, I think my favorite nickname was Pocahontas. <laughs> and he laughs. He goes, a lot of people tell me that. A lot of uh, but then, you know what? Then he went into a two- or three-minute uh, kind of uh, conversation about why it was so fraudulent what she did and how the nickname was a perfect way to expose that fraud. So the left thinks he's making you know, racist slurs, which he's not. And what pr the president understands as a marketer is if you want people to connect to the violation, you don't write another white paper. You call him Pocahontas. <laughs> All right, so I mean, it, and that was the first of many interactions. But I'm telling you, he loves this country. He loves our military and our vets. Uh, and he, he has a heart for a lot of these guys who have been wrongly accused on the battlefield. And he says, if we went and sent you to fight ISIS, and then, you, and then you come home and we prosecute you, that's not okay. So what you can know is that his core is there. That's awesome. Uh, so, Andy's pro-life. Pro yep. And he so, believes in the Second Amendment. So I want to preface this question with saying this isn't a complaint. It's an important thing that people here understand. Why don't we see Convention of States more on Fox News? I hear this a lot from the grassroots. Uh, yeah. I need to work harder, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, first of all, when people spend the time to meet with Mark, uh, like Judge Andrew Napolitano, uh, like Steve Hilton, uh, you know, when they spend the time, they're in. Uh, and they get it, and they realize it. You know, very prominent endorsers, obviously, like Mark Levin, who's, who's the godfather uh, on this topic, Sean Hannity and others. I think, and this is not to speak too generally, because Fox is a series of different departments with different priorities, so you, you, you can't generalize as it pertains to Fox. Ultimately, I think there's a lot of people that just say, well, can that work? Is it viable? It's the same challenges that you face. 
Like, talk to me when there's 23, 24, 25 states. Right now, it just doesn't feel like there's a pathway. I'm not really hearing that much about it. Again, most people that live in Manhattan have never been to a grassroots event, let alone a conservative one, let alone a convention of states one, right? So again, it's an example of if and when you build it, then they will come. But forecast this future. This movement's at 28, 29, 30 states. Now you're going to have every video camera in America camped out outside your state legislature saying, is this really going to happen? Could it be 31? Could it be 32? Because now that's good TV, which remember, networks love ratings. Uh, and that is as much as we've, that's, that, that is something folks pay attention to. Uh, but I, then we get to have the national conversation. Then what you've built triggers a conversation that has needed to be had for a very long time about why this is necessary. So, <clears throat> but count me in, uh, you know, within the confines of what I'm allowed to do and not allowed to do, because I'm very, I, I like, uh, my job currently, I have <laughs> kids in a mortgage, uh, but within the confines of what I can do to introduce Mark and the comms team and others to producers and decision makers there who decide what goes on and what doesn't uh, so that when, when Tom Coburn could be a great spokesman for something on the Constitution or Mark could, you know, they're in the Rolodex and that's part of what we want to do. For sure. Yeah, and this is, to me, this is something really important for you guys to understand. This has been a hard lesson for me in politics. Uh, I used to think they should talk about what I like because it's important to me, so it should be <laughs> on television, right? And one of the things that we've had to learn, this is really important that you guys understand this, the news comes in cycles. The cycles come incredibly fast right now. And the way that we get in the news is by fitting ourselves into the cycle, not the other way around. You know, President Trump can make the cycle, we can't make the cycle, <laughs> right? And so our job is to pay attention to the news as it unfolds, insert ourselves locally into the cycle where you can, where you're relevant. And I think it's really important, this is we're talking about on the national stage, but this plays out at the macro level too. I mean, you guys gotta understand, in your local media markets, make yourselves available. We have in the room a bunch of media liaisons. This is their expertise in their state. They're trained to do this. Talk to your local newspaper reporters. Know the local newspaper. They're dying for content, guys. If you have a local newspaper, totally. local radio, they're dying for content. If you're any good at this stuff, then get involved in that. If you're not, then get good at it. One of the things I, I will, I'm going to give you a major recommendation. If you're in this room and you have not done this, you should do this. Join Toastmasters. Learn to speak publicly. This is a really important thing for us. We, all of us, we collectively are the face of the movement. You have to be able to speak to people. You have to be able to stand on a stage maybe or even an elevator pitch. But you've got to be able to be articulate and concise. And so get trained up to do that. That's how we're going to get more media. Media, like everything else, bubbles up from the bottom. When it's big enough, when there's enough noise, when it's a prominent enough and popular enough, I promise you, we'll be on Fox as much as we can possibly handle. And, and to piggyback on that, it's all about relationships. Producers don't call people they don't know. News directors don't call people they don't know. And you forget, like politics, when you go on Capitol Hill and you meet these, the staffers for senators and congressmen, they're like 23 years old, right? They're 23, 20, 20. And, you know, maybe not as worldly wise as you would want them to be. It can be the same in some of the newsrooms uh, elsewhere. They're, these are young, dynamic people who are on top of the 24-hour news cycle and haven't stopped to think, well, let me build more relationships with grassroots folks. I mean, it, and they're probably not going to respond to a random mass-produced email that comes out that says, cover this. That goes straight into the delete inbox. So it's got to be meet them persistently. Can I buy you coffee and tell you about what we're doing? You may not need me now, but you might need me six months from now if you want someone to come talk about the Constitution or what we're doing in the legislature. I mean, that's going to that's gonna have a residual impact. So I have a bunch of questions from the grassroots. While I go through those and, and figure out what order to put them in, I, I would like you to tell us What's the craziest, funniest thing that's ever happened to you at Fox? Since you've been at Fox? I know there's a bunch of them. Maybe pick a couple if you can't name one. Uh, well, let me think. Okay, so the first weekend ever I ever hosted, I can talk about this now because I think the litigation is over. <laughs> <laughs> I think. That's a good setup. Uh, I accidentally hit a West Point band drum member with an ax on live television. <laughs> Everybody's fine. 
In the military, you're trained to know what, what's behind your target, right? Especially as an infantryman. You don't shoot anything, you don't know what's behind it. But when it's your first time hosting and there's a lumberjack segment and some producer says, hey, throw the axe for the tees, you just pick it up and throw it. And so in my mind, I was like, well, I'm not going to throw this into the dirt like a first pitch. I'm going to throw this thing. Well, it was a real deal double-sided axe. And it went over the target instead. And I didn't know that the West Point drum band was behind the target. <laughs> And so it ricocheted off the ground, and thank, thank God, just the handle hit one of the drummers. Uh, and, and he was okay, and there's, I won't say anything else about that. Uh, <laughs> but it's mortifying. I had to do three and a half more hours of television after just having almost killed somebody, and it was terrible. Uh, and then the other one was, I, you figure out, I mean, there, is an, there are an army of people in the, on the left today, their entire job is to try to get us fired. So they watch the show, and they try to take anything you say, offhand, off color, a joke, not a joke, and they clip it and they push it out and they mischaracterize it in the hopes they can get it picked up in the media and get you fired. Like, I'm pretty sure there's an employee whose job is like, get Pete Hexeth fired somewhere. Uh, you know, Tucker's got 10 of them, whatever it is. Uh, but in this particular case, we had on Saturday of the weekend show eaten some Pizza Hut pizza. And if you know me, I love Pizza Hut pizza and just food generally. Uh, and so I put it underneath the couch, and then the next morning when we came in, I pulled it out underneath the couch, the box, you know, and there's still some pizza in there. And as you know, pizza the next day can be pretty good. <laughs> so, so I pull the pizza out, I take, a, I take a bite, like during the beginning of the show, hey, this is good. And, you know, my co-host Jedediah was like, who's, you know, is more um, conscious of germs, you might say. <laughs> clean. Clean. <laughs> Uh, goes, isn't that gross? What about the germs? And I said, well, I'm pretty sure I haven't washed my hands for 10 years. Uh, I don't believe germs are a real thing. I can't see them, therefore they're not real. <laughs> and I, I've inoculated myself, I can't get sick. Like that's a direct <laughs> quote, right? This is morning television. You make jokes, you have fun. Well, not, a, not, in, the, in, not in the internet. It became the number one globally trending topic on Facebook around the world that Fox News anchor hasn't washed his hands in 10 years. <laughs> At one point, I almost got compelled to put out a statement that said, I believe germs are real. <laughs> I refused. I'm like, I will not cave to that. Uh, but it's just the things you did. <laughs> So it's, there's always interesting stuff, yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, uh, it's hard to get serious after that, Pete. <laughs> so we have a, an emerging leaders program where we bring interns in from all around the country. I think these are the cream of the crop of young people in America. Do we have our interns in the room right now? Can you guys stand up if we've got interns with us? <laughs> and interns who become employees. I think there might be a couple of the table that aren't standing there, interns who are now our program coordinators. Weston and Jack, are you guys here? Where's Jack? Weston, stand up, please. <laughs> By the way, just so you know, Pete, this guy, and if Jack's outside, can somebody drag his mangy butt in the room, please? <laughs> I'm using that term lovingly because Weston and Jack both just finished officer, officer candidate school for the Marine Corps. Very cool. <laughs> There's Jack at the back of the room there. So we're really proud of these guys. Uh, and so when Weston writes a question, I have to respond okay. to the young Marine. Wait, he can write? <laughs> we know he can fight. <laughs> <laughs> with a crayon. So Weston uh, asked a question. He says, what book or speech besides the Bible is the most influential in your life? Hmm. I, would have, I, I would have said the Bible, and the reason I'm so passionate about that is it, is it is the narrative through which we have a conversation inside Western civilization. It's why through Fox Nation, I've, I'm going back to Jerusalem and Israel uh, in, in a month for, uh, two week, for 10 days to film two more documentaries. We did a documentary about the battle in the Holy City in Jerusalem. Without understanding that heritage and uh, you can't have a, 
That's part of the reason we can't even have a conversation today is because that's not part of the fabric of what kids learn at all. Uh, so A number one on that. The next one is a book, uh, I don't know if it's well known or not, but it was introduced to me by someone influential in my life early on. It was called, it's called Smiling Through the Cultural Catastrophe. And it's by Jeffrey Hart, he's a Dartmouth professor. And it's, I don't know, it's 15, 20 years old. Uh, but it was in response, or at least in addition to a book written by Alan Bloom called Closing of the American Mind, which was about higher education and yep. kind of way ahead of the curve of the lunacy that we have today about how liberal, uh, Small L liberal colleges have become completely illiberal and intolerant of dissenting views, and here we are today. Uh, but what Jeffrey Hart wrote in Smiling Through the Cultural Catastrophe was effectively a simplified, dumbed-down understanding of what makes up Western civilization. Uh, so you don't have to do, you don't have to take, you know, you don't have to be a philosophy major at Dartmouth to understand it. Here it is distilled down into the great men and women and the great books and the great uh, movements and arcs in history. And effectively that it's uh, the nexus of Athens and Jerusalem uh, are the two core strands of Western civilization that have both in, uh, supported each other but also been in tension. And it's the maintenance of that tension that has made Western civilization so successful over time. And as someone who, you know, likes to fancy that he understands history but really doesn't, it, it, I mean, no one can truly understand how it all, but it helped crystallize why what we have is so special in an even larger context. So I would highly, highly recommend it, and any book written by Mark Levin. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so this goes uh, specifically to your experience in helping vets and the VA. The person says, uh, and this is Ann Brigham. Uh, she's our grassroots coordinator from Wisconsin, the great state of Wisconsin. Thanks for being here. I know Eric appreciates that. Uh, says, Pete, thank you for using the term customer rather than consumer when talking about the VAA customers. Can you explain the, to the audience the difference of the mindset between those two terms? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, a customer who is someone who gets to make a choice and ultimately is catered to because you want their business again. Uh, as opposed to a consumer, which is a more clinical explanation for someone who receives something in any context in which they receive it. So a consumer can be someone who the government gives to to consume, but a government doesn't treat people like customers until it's forced to do so, which is why choice is so important in almost every context. Now I work a lot on educational choice for vets. It turns out the elites in Washington don't like all those for evil for-profit schools that provide trade and vocational skills to vets and others coming home. It's got to be the public captured mafia of four-year universities that, <laughs> that poison the minds of kids. Uh, I mean, listen, in, in due time, I will be giving back my degrees to Princeton and Harvard, and I'm actually not kidding. I'm actually not kidding. That's, that is where... Uh, because I think we hold on to these... These, like, uh, how would you put it? Colorful remembrances of our alma maters. And then we just shower them with money and, and alumni time and everything. And then we kind of like the sports team, but we forget that they're actually a massive net negative in our culture and our country today. Absolutely. Massive. So why are we reinforcing that? Uh, and instead, finding your Hillsdales and your College of the Ozarks and your Liberty Universities and your places like that that are creating real patriots and citizens that are knowledgeable of our, of our country. So I don't know how I got to that from the VA. <laughs> uh, but, but, but to me, it's all about choice for individuals. And, and government will never give you that. Uh, and it was a perfect microcosm. Uh, so at Convention of States, we want to restore a culture of self-governance. How would you sell that concept to people who don't understand it, the idea of self-governance? Culture of self-governance. I mean, the, I, I think... <laughs> Without faith, a lot of this stuff is really hard to explain. Because if you don't have faith and understanding of something greater than yourself, of your own humility, of your sinful nature, uh, then you, you are willing to become subservient to uh, a Leviathan of big government that tells you how you ought live. Uh, which is why our founders understood that premise so directly. Because when you understand your human nature and then therefore your relationship to the limits of what a human-led government can do, that it empowers you as the individual with faith and fidelity to the principles of your country to be emboldened, to be defiant. Uh, so, and that's why 
secularism is such a religion of the left. That's why stripping faith out of the public square is so significant to them, is because it actually disempowers individuals. Again, with the left, it's always the opposite. They always sell you the opposite of the truth. They tell you that faith enslaves you. It makes you subservient when it actually it sets you free because you know the truth and you are set free. So, and listen, and I say that, I, I say that as the least perfect person on the planet. Like, I also think there's, a, there's, a, there's an iteration a lot of us need to go to from self-righteousness to humility. And when you learn humility and grace, you can afford it to other people, but also stand bold in your convictions, even knowing that you, you fail time and time again in need of, of the salvation of a Lord and Savior. So I, I think uh, that iteration for people is an important one to getting to a place where you build a movement like this of fellow patriots and fellow sinners who know uh, with the right compass we can still get in the right direction. So this was a pre-submitted question from Brenda Carlin, who's our Florida Grassroots Coordinator. She said, how do we stop tyranny from using liberty to destroy liberty? And she said this was something she heard you talk about on the radio previously. Ooh, that's deep. <laughs> how do we stop? Let's how do we stop uh, tyranny from using our liberty to destroy our liberty? How do we stop tyranny? Well, I don't know how to answer that. And if I said it, I was having a really smart day. <laughs> <laughs> or a really dumb day. I don't know. Um, no, she's saying you said you don't know. She was wondering if you had an updated perspective on that. I said that I didn't know. Yeah. Well, then I still don't know. Uh, I mean, I just think, I, I wrote a book uh, called In the Arena where it talked about the ingredients of a good citizen. And I, I always come back to that. It's like willingness to work, will it not be dependent, willingness to fight. Um, big, big patriotic families, demographics really do matter, putting it to the next generation, and then the willingness to fight for something greater than yourself. So. If you use your liberty, I'm gonna to try to deconstruct my own nonsense. Uh, if you use your liberty to be dependent and not work, if you use your liberty to sit on the couch and play Fortnite, but not actually go to your city council meetings and make sure they say the pledge, if you use your liberty to say, I don't want, you know, listen, I, don't, I try not to get into family and family dynamics of number of kids and all of that, because those are very personal decisions. But if you, you can decide your priorities in many different ways. Uh, if you decide, I'm going to use my liberty to not believe in anything greater than myself, then I think you do lead to the encroachment of more government, even if you think, well, I'm just doing my thing. That's where active citizenship matters. That's where I look at my parents, who are wonderful people. My dad's a retired athletic director, was a basketball coach and a high school gym teacher. My mom stayed at home with us, you know, works at our church and everything. And they've done everything right, and they're wonderful. But I kind of use them as an example, and I look at them and I say, but the next chapter of America needs you more actively now. It's not enough to just say like, I watch Fox, go Pete, and I'll vote. <laughs> it's like, I need you out there. I need you writing up beds. I need your credibility knocking on doors of state legislators. <laughs> so. Okay, a couple things we gotta do before we close. I gotta tell a quick story uh, about my daughter and you. Okay. And uh, you guys know Lucy, right? Everybody knows Lucy. And she's a senior now, by the way, at Hillsdale wow. College. Pretty cool, getting ready to graduate. Pete's met her. Uh, she's a big fan. And the first time that I was on Fox and Friends with Pete, and we were on the set, the white chairs, I still remember yep. those, because had, we had one of our supporters said, where do I get those white chairs? <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't about us, it was about the chairs. I tried to look for where you they were. You actually made. did. You I flipped did. the chair over and found the label. And, <laughs> and she now owns those white chairs, I'm proud to say. <laughs> Anything to serve the grassroots, you guys. <laughs> But something happened on stage that day that was uh, such a father moment if you have a teenage daughter. I know your kids aren't quite this old, but you'll, you'll get to this point, trust me. And so I'm on TV and I love to hear from my family afterwards because they're the biggest fans and also the most honest critics, right? Yep. They'll actually tell you like, yeah, you kind of suck today, right? <laughs> yeah, they will. Most other people won't say that. Uh, so I'm on with you. I think we have a fantastic segment. I'm really happy with it. And we're sitting in these two kind of modern chairs sitting pretty much just like this. And so I said to Lucy, how was it? She said, it was awesome. What's with the socks? This is on text, right? I'm like, what do you mean what's with the socks? She goes, Look at Pete, you're wearing old man socks. 
Like what? I had not what? anymore. No, though. not anymore. Look, hey man. Look at that. I learn. I, I took. I take fashion lessons from my daughter. Like, Fantastic. We got it dialed in now. Ever since then, trust me, I'm not caught dead in black <laughs> socks, man. She's my biggest critic. So <laughs> that's the lead into this, which is in your honor, we had designed convention of state socks. No right? kidding. So today we have a presentation for you. Whoops. No. Your very own pair of convention of state socks. Look at that. Are you kidding me? We're going to see those on Fox and Friends, right? <laughs> I... All right. Tune in tomorrow morning. You'll All see right, these on see? the couch. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's, that's Article 5. That's the V for Article 5. I love it. Five. I love it. Thank you. All right. We've got to so do much. one more thing now. Don't yes. sit down. So we have a request from the grassroots all around the country. There are literally thousands of them watching this. They RSVP'd online, so they're watching us here. So they ask that we turn around our backs to the audience and do a selfie of okay. everybody who's here so they get a full <laughs> picture. So we're going to do that from up here. Let's do it. Because, you know, we're young and hip and we do selfies. <laughs> Or so I've we'll been told, it. right? We'll we'll <laughs> All right, it. here we go. All right, so we need you guys to raise your hands. Big Put stand up. Come on. Oh, I gotta flip. Look, I got to flip. Here we go. Ready? All right, one, two, three. All right, there we All go. All right, now we... Thank Give you guys so much. Give a big round of so applause much. to our Thank good you. friend, Pete Hegseth. Thank you guys so much. You're the best, brother. God bless Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Go to conventionofstates.com, press the button, sign the petition. More importantly, get 10 of your friends to do the same. When you sign the petition, then that sends a letter to your state legislator. You go on the list in their district as a supporter. We deliver those lists to the state legislators. It means something to them.